Hi, and welcome to APOS, American Armenian Health Professional Organization's TV Health Program. Last two decades has been significant events in medicine, especially in genetic research and development, as well as stem cells research and development. Today with us are Dr. Ripsim Ohanian, who is board certified in obstetric and gynecology, regenerative medicine, as well as laser medicine and surgery. Dr. Ohanian, welcome to our program. Thank you um, very much. Stem cells are so important now with the treatment and research and development. Mm -hmm. Let's say, let's talk about what is the audiences, what is the stem cells? Let's start from that. Okay, so stem cells have a wide variety of um, relevance. So they start from the embryo, and they could be all the way down to the stem cells that actually regenerate your hair, make your hair grow, and your nails, etc. So that within that whole big spectrum of stem cells, we have um, very immature stem cells that, uh, in an embryo, makes the baby, the entire embryo, and generates an organism, um, a human organism, whatever, and then the components of the organism um, or the inner organs and the cell structures of the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So the entire organism. Then you have the mature adult stem cells that are within an organism once they develop that has different potentials in different components of the body and they are capable of regenerating themselves, regenerating more of themselves and also other cellular components to help the body heal, repair during damage and also reproduce because we have to constantly reproduce right. to live. Right. So we are really born with mature cells that Correct. they develop the organs. At the same time, we have this stem cells that Correct. they are not matured, they are not specialized, Correct. and they are there for us to tap into, to utilize. Correct. So we can get it from embryo, we can get it from umbilical cord, yes. Correct. And we can get it from what else? Well, when you say the embryo, uh, it's a whole c c component of the placenta itself. The embryo itself is forbidden because right. of the ethics and the potential that it can stimulate tumor if it's manipulated and used in regenerative process to heal and repair the body. Well, we but the entire placenta, fluid. correct, yeah. the entire placenta has components that we can use. The umbilical cord, blood, mm -hmm. is very important. The cord um, wart and jelly, which is the cushioning material that's within the cord, it's extremely important. The amnion itself, which is the inner cell wall that contains the amniotic fluid, fluid that uh, cushions the baby, and then the chorion which separates the baby, um, the entire baby organism from the mother. Okay, all of this contains stem cells and different types of stem cells that have different function. They're all being right. used right now. So we can get then from, right. and from this, the placenta, correct. we can get from umbilical cord, correct. we can get amniotic fluid which when they are doing diagnostic testing during pregnancy, correct. it's it's um, it's easy and when they are doing it they correct. can do that. And, they and still now we have obviously adult adult stem cells. Correct. So which ones are we using for the treatment right now? Okay, so the uh, placental component of the um, uh, fetal stem cells is smack in the middle of embryonic and the adult stem cells. So those are the ones that we are using, and we're also using some adult cells. Embryonic is forbidden. So when we say the, they fall right in the middle, they are capable of being what we call pluripotent. They are capable of producing a lot of cells, different cells as well as themselves, and they have medicinal effects where they signal within the body to uh, promote repair. Uh, so, so therefore, we mm -hmm. use umbilical cord stem cells right. for different reasons, such as, let's say, autism, um, let's say, um, multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. um, Alzheimer's they've been using, um, spinal, cord injury. spinal cord injuries, there's other uh, children's diseases, Hurler's disease, Fanconi's uh, anemia, all kinds of other anemia, sickle cell anemia. So depending on what component of the cord blood that they're using depends on what the um, usage is for. So for example, if it's for hematologic, then they basically use the hematopoietic stem which is cells. Bone marrow. Bone marrow. Which we have been using for years now. Correct. For bone marrow transplant. Correct. But the umbilical cord is also hematopoietic, but it yeah. is underdeveloped. Right. Underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it has less rejection. But yes. when you use the bone marrow hematopoietic, the more chest. rejection. Right. Therefore, uh, the umbilical cord cells are becoming a lot more valuable for that reason. But also in the umbilical cord, just like our own bone marrow, which is very similar to, has mesenchymal stem cells, which has capabilities of regenerating our other tissues. Those are being now used for regenerating the brain, spinal cord, organs, right. um, genetic disorders, hurlers, and any other, um, even right. You know. But in your practical point, yeah. uh, then when we go into stem cells, that now 
Let's talk about your practice that you mm-hmm. do some stem cell treatments. And let's take one thing at a time. I know Correct. you do for incontinence, for women incontinence. Correct. And let's talk about that and then we go to other part of the body. Sure. So what I'm using is the adult stem cells that is um, the closest to what we call the pluripotent stem cells that make um, different germ layers, the three important germ layers that we are tapping into to make um, muscle, cartilage, bone, blood, et cetera, et cetera. So the only one that comes close to that is either bone marrow, which is difficult to get, and it has to be in large numbers, and of course it's invasive, or we can get it from the fat, which Everybody has lots of fat. So what we do is we do liposuction, limited amount, based on how much we're going to use. And within the fat cells, there are what we call uh, perivascular, which is a, a, a grouping of blood vessels, Between amongst which are blood cells. cells. Yes. Yes. So between these globules of fat cells are blood vessels, and around the blood uh, vessels are these tiny little nests of stem cells that are being nourished by the blood vessels. These stem cells are called progenerator cells, and they are pluripotent. Not quite embryonic, but in between. When we say pluripotent, we are saying that they they can can multiply, they can make the repair. Right. Right. So they they have the capability of multiplying by producing themselves if they're needed, or other cell stem cells, so they can generate other tissue and they can also signal um, to other cells so that they can have other medicinal effects such as cell-to-cell contact or um, regenerating uh, vascular tissue, nerve tissue, etc. Right. etc. Et practical point yeah. now. So your woman comes in, has urinary incontinence, right. has a difficulty of holding the urine right. and then you say we are going to have now stem cell treatment for you. So what is the process? You okay. Fat and yeah. So first we evaluate, we diagnose what type of incontinence they have because it's not just one incontinence. Right. So once we label different types of incontinence, it's um, a urodynamic study you do. Exactly. It's computerized, so there's no guessing game. So once we do that, then we give them the option of doing the stem cells, where we harvest some fat under local anesthesia in the office. Not a big deal. We harvest it, and we have a special kit that was invented in uh, Italy. It's called Lipogems, which has now been purchased by Strike who makes the prosthesis for the knees. So obviously they saw the value in this. So they are applying this to joints, which I also have been doing in the last uh, three, four years. So anyway, I process it in this kit, and what it does is it it breaks down mechanically, it's a completely closed sterile system, mechanically breaking down the fat cells so that it releases the The stem stem cells and growth factors that we call stromovascular fraction. It's a combination of things that are in there. And it releases it, and we're washing out the fat and the debris. So what we are left when we collect it, and it's a process in itself, is um, aliquots aliquots of stem cells Mm -hmm. and the irrigation fluid, which is saline. So once we let the saline wash out, because it floats, it has a tendency to stick and float, so we then consolidate the stem cells or the stromovascular fraction. I, I'm calling it stromovascular fraction because if I say stem cells, it has to be enzymatically digested and you just get pure stem cells. Mm-hmm. This has growth factors, growth and, together which is more important because they work well together. It's like right. a key and a lock. So if you take the key and the lock, separate it, they don't work well. Right. And we don't quite understand how well they work and how they interact. So, so when how we, long does it take this process? The process takes about about an hour, hour and a half to process this. So I would say roughly an hour, depending on how much. Right. And then once we have it set up, we bring the patient into the ultrasound room, right. we do sterile um, evaluation, we visualize the bladder neck, I put a Foley catheter in so I know where the bladder neck is, and under ultrasound guidance I inject into the urethral wall that we call the periurethral space. Right. So I'm putting in small aliquots, let's say starting at 3 o'clock down to, I don't know, 6 o'clock, um, o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, whatever I can right. put, depending on the amount of space I have. You can never yes. do 12 o'clock, you're under the periosteum, yes. uh, the, 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 the pubic symphysis. Right. right. So I could do maybe four injections, I could do three injections, depending on how much space I have. So once I do that, you can actually visualize on the ultrasound a little bit of a ballooning effect of the white material it doesn't take anymore, okay? And the Foley's still in. So once the injection's done, I let the patient rest, and we know it's not a bulking effect, because if it's a bulking effect, I cannot take the Foley out. Yes. It actually gets absorbed in the perivascular sure. space, mm-hmm. uh-huh, through the bloodstream, yes. in the vicinity. Yes. Exactly. And then the Foley, when I, once I re- empty the fluid in the easily bulb, easily out slides out. Yes. 
depending on how much I put. Now that seems to be dependent on the amount of incontinence they have and what their urethral pressures are at rest. Right. So it directly correlates. So those who have low pressures who are losing a lot of urine, let's say they're wetting eight pounds a day, and their urethral pressures are below 20, which is considered we know from is low. Stuff, Correct. So we know right. where they are. Correct. So normal is around 75, 80. Low normal is 4. They have some leakage. When they're below 40, they have, uh, depending on how low, 20 is significant leakage. Right. So depending on how much space they have, and when you do ultrasound eval evaluation of the urethra, you actually don't see the nice linear muscles, which is a little white strips that you see of the muscle, and you see a funneling effect. That is all disappearing with follow-up injections. Right. So then we know then that. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for the woman to see the result? Okay, so... They had the injection, they right, go home now, what right. do we expect? So theoretically, what, under, what our understanding is, within three days the stem cells are signaling to the tissues in the surrounding to call in growth factors that actually regenerate what is needed. So the muscle is weak, I need to make muscle. You don't have enough circulation because the patient's in menopause and circulation's lacking, so we're uh, stimulating a um, um, uh, vascular system. Uh, VEGF comes in, growth factors, and stimulates that. Um, not enough control, the nerves aren't working well, so they regenerate nerve. So all these things are happening within the first three to so five days. No, they're smart enough mm -hmm. to know yes. in that vicinity what do they need to change exactly. and to the system so they can hold yeah. their ear. Right. That's, in fact, their right. nickname is nickname is smart cells. So that's it. It's a good result. Right. They're holding their urine now. Right. How long this might last, and when they need an, another injection? Okay. So that's that's debatable because uh, honestly, there hasn't been any urethral studies like this. There have been rectal studies, and they've been holding for five years in Italy. Okay. They did rectal incontinence um, studies with this. Um, my study has gone three years right now, and I find that between the first year, second year, and third year, it's still plateauing, although it's gradual, but it has not leveled off yet. Okay. Good. It's still so going really up. Good news, actually. Right. More than two years or so, they are three doing years. at least okay. Yeah. How about the male? Male incontinence. You know, After it, a special process. Right. So it should work also for the male incontinence, but um, I have not been able to get urologists who are interested in doing this as an outpatient setting because they're employees at the hospital and they have restrictions, but I do have a protocol that will be done with the males. Let's quickly talk about the knee injection. Mm -hmm. and stem cells in the knee treatment. Right. For the knee, um, you know, we're basically trying to be anti-inflammatory. We're trying to regenerate cartilage, which we're not 100% sure. We do see some changes with the MRI, but it depends on who's reading and what they're looking for. Right. Like we all know, you know, radiologists. Knee injections for the knee? Yeah. I mean, so far I injected myself uh, three years ago and it's holding strong. Um, I've had other people that I've injected are in the same time frame. You know, they can go up and down the stairs. They're doing their, you know, um, running, so whatever, and it's fine. A place now but for I, the knee and right. The My guess is about five years. I'm guessing. I'm guessing that's going to be the pivot point where there's going to be a slight decline unless they injure it. If right. they do not injure it, I think because the aging process, it may go more, more but I think the pivot point is going to be five right. years. But I'm sure in the near future we'll be using stem cells for so many diseases. And well, so we many, are already. So many applications S are going to be there for that. Especially in Asia. They're, right. they're way ahead. They're, way they're, ahead right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ohanian, thank you very much for your enlightening information. Oh, we'll thank you, you so much. Program. Now it's time for this week's article. It is red meat intake and mortality and whether the risk is modified by fruits and vegetable intake. Studies have shown that high intakes of red meat is associated with higher risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, and certain cancers. The harmful effects are more pronounced with consumption of processed red meat, such as sausages, hot dogs, and cold cuts. Processed meat contains nit and nitroso compounds, which have been known to be carcinogens. On the other hand, fruits and vegetables in particular have been linked to various health benefits, such as lower risk of cardiovascular disease and longer survival. It has been hypothesized that increased intake of fruits and vegetables may counterbalance the potential harmful effects of red meat, especially processed red meat. Recently, a study from Sweden included more than 74,000 men and women during 16-year follow-up to determine whether red meat consumption and the risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortalities differs with the fruits and vegetable intake. Compared with the participants who had less than one serving a week red meat consumption, those who had more than a week red meat consumption had 21% increased risk of all-cause mortality, 29% increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality, and cancer mortality. Results were similar across amounts of fruits and vegetables consumption, and no interaction between red meat and fruit and vegetables consumption was detected. Conclusion of this study was, 
high intakes of red meat, especially processed red meat, were associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. Eating fruits and vegetables did not contract the deleterious effect of red meat. So stay away from processed red meat and consume unprocessed red meat not more than once a week and always eat your plenty of fruits and vegetables. Good health is precious and priceless. Visit Alpo's website, ahpo.org, for up-to-date information. I'm Dr. Orhan Karadoprak. Until next program, so long.